So with that, uh, tonight's presenters is me, as usual, Joe Deli Carpini. I'm the Science and Operations Officer. Uh, I manage the research and training program for the office. And with me tonight is Rodney Chai, one of our meteorologists. Rodney is just finishing up uh, a little evening of severe weather, but he's at the office and will be helping me present tonight. So in tonight's webinar, some of the questions we're going to answer about tornadoes are how many tornadoes occur here on average and in other parts of the country? How do tornadoes form? Um, how do we determine the strength of a tornado? We're actually going to take you along on a mini storm damage survey. Rodney will be leading us through that. And then most of the presentation is actually discussing some of the more significant tornadoes that have occurred here. Um, actually going back to the first tornado outbreak in New England in the 1700s. So we're not going to ha have every single tornado, but some of the more significant ones, the more um, historical events that certainly have occurred, we will discuss. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rodney, and he can begin with a look at our tornado statistics. Rodney? Thank you, Joe. So, um, yeah, one of the most burning questions that people would have is, you know, how how many tornadoes um, have we observed in New England? And, and we do have some statistics of reported tornadoes broken down by counties as shown in this, um, this graphic right here. And, and you will see that there's, um, there are more reported tornadoes um, towards Western Massachusetts and Connecticut, uh, much, much more than Eastern Massachusetts and uh, and Rhode Island, and and one of the reason is um, because you know you get that, especially in spring, you get that cool um, marine influence uh, from the ocean. The ocean temperature is still very cold, and that usually kind of um, limit the, the the extent of severe weather uh, for for the east. But they do get into the action as the, as the ocean temperatures warm, um, and that's. Uh, you know, later in the summer. Um, so looking across the country, um, unsurprisingly, the Southern Plains and parts of the Deep South have a lot more tornadoes than, than the Northeast. Um, and we call that area the Tornado Alley, uh, stretching from Texas all the way up into Nebraska, Minnesota. Um, and Texas has to lead the nation with the average number of tornadoes per year, followed by uh, Kansas and Oklahoma. And this is a plot of the tornado tracks um, from 1950 to 2016. And you see that, um, you know, there's a kind of a area maximum of tornadoes east of the Rockies and west of the, the Ohio River Valley. And that correspond with the, the tornado alley that we know about. Uh, again, you can see a lot of tornadoes in Kansas and Oklahoma. And, and notice there's also a, a second area of, um, in the deep south, um, you know, states like Mississippi, Alabama, um, and especially this past severe season, they, they have seen their fair share of tornadoes, especially in April. Um, so. Those are the areas that are concentrated. And so why does the tornado alley see so many tornadoes? Um, and the, the main reason, um, you know, there will be, I can boil it out down into two reasons. Um, so in early spring, you have that um, clash of air mass. And I, I used to live in Kansas for three years and I can, you know, attest to, how flat uh, the, the central plains and southern plains are. And the flatness of the terrain means that there's nothing to block the, you know, the cold Canadian air from rushing south. But then on the other hand, you have that, uh, the gulf moisture lifting northwards. Um, and when you have such contrasting air masses, um, you tend to have storms in the vicinity. And, and the second ingredient is the, the low level jet um, and the low level jet is, is critical um, because it provides spin to the atmosphere. It provides, um, you know, that means that the winds are, think about it, the, the winds are from the Northwest um, 
you know, at 30,000 feet, but from the southwest at the lowest 5,000 feet. So that um, for tornadoes to form, you need um, rotation uh, throughout the atmosphere. So that's, um, you know, when all these ingredients come together, you get, um, you know, thunderstorms that can produce tornadoes um, in the spring. So how do tornadoes form? So I talked a little bit about rotation um, and the scientific term is called wind shear. Uh, there are two types of shear. One is directional, that is um, the change in wind direction with height. Um, and then the other one is speed shear. Um, so that's changing of wind speed with height. Um, more often than not, um, you know, we get stronger winds um, aloft or at higher altitudes, um, but that's not ne not necessarily the case. Uh, you know, in the in the central plains, you get a low level jet can be 70, 80 knots at 5,000 feet. So, um, and sometimes you get combination of both. Um, so you have winds changing direction and speed at uh, different altitudes. So, um, as forecasters, we if we see strong, um, you know, signatures of strong wind shear, uh, we tend to be uh, a, a little bit more uh, concerned and um, about the, the threat for tornadoes. And uh, this is just another graphic to um, to summarize what we talked about. Um, so on the first image, you see um, you have directional shear. Uh, you have stronger winds um, from the west um, at higher altitude and winds from the southeast near the ground. And, um, you know, when you have combined that with um, intense updraft, as you see in image number two, um, you get that, yeah, you have a very unstable environment typically created by um, strong heating near the surface. Um, and then you get the rotation, so that updraft is being um, tilted. Um, so you get that um, classic overshooting top, but then you also get that um, tilt to the storm. And that tilt is important because if you ha get a storm that is totally vertical, it just rains itself out. And that's what we call a pulse thunder storm. And sometimes we get that, and you know, it this to localize heavy downpour, but uh, not much, nothing else in terms of um, severe uh, damage other than localized flooding. So um, that's why the wind shear is so important because it tilts the updraft um, away from the, um, the downpours that develop and prevents it from raining itself out. So giving it more longevity. So, um, and in the central plains, you get a lot of what we call supercell thunderstorms. Uh, and sometimes we get that in the northeast, and and when we do get that, um, those are were associated with some of our more severe tornado outbreaks, as Joe will touch on later. Um, but when you get a supercell thunderstorm, and in the plains, um, I used to do a little bit of chasing myself. And storm chasers, um, you know, sometimes they like to look at the, the structure of the supercell thunderstorm. You can get overshooting tops like 70,000 feet, you know, well into the stratosphere. Um, so that's very typical of um, a very intense updraft. And typically these storms can last for hours because, um, and they have more time to become severe. And besides tornadoes, you can get very large hail, like uh, golf ball size up to grapefruit size hail. Um, and a lot of times the, the storm chases, they go out to chase tornadoes, but then they end up getting their, their vehicles dented. Um, it's not surprising with the large hail. And also you get damaging wind as well, 70 mile per hour or more. So this is a graphic showing how 
a super cell thunderstorm look down, look from the top down. Um, as forecaster, we when we see kind of a hook like structure, uh, that would immediately get our attention because that's um, you know that's symbolic of a super cell thunderstorm, and you have an intense updraft, um, and and then on the back of the storm you have a, what we call a rear flank downdraft. So essentially, the storm is able to sustain itself over a long time when it has such structure. Um, and a fun fact. Uh, the June 1953 Worcester tornado was produced by a supercell thunderstorm. And, and likewise for the 2011 Springfield tornado, again, Joe was touched on um, later in the presentation. So how do you determine the strength of a tornado? So we do storm surveys uh, and when we go out, to the side, we look for tornado damage or suspected tornado damage, um, particularly if it results in injuries or unfortunate, unfortunately fatalities. Uh, we also look for high impact wind damage. Uh, it could be snap trees or just homes that are destroyed. Uh, and we also look for, um, you know, signatures of flash flooding um, because you, besides if you can get a supercell thunderstorm, it means that it has also like in all likelihood will produce a lot of rain as well. Not all the time, but um, um, and yeah, so continuing. Um, so we and this can happen back in our office as well. We review the radar data um, and alongside with information from the, uh, the local emergency managers. Um, so we basically compare radar with ground truth and the radar often can indicate whether the damage may or may not be tornadic. Um, and of course, when we go on site, we you know, look for um, the damage and you know, try to estimate the wind speed. Um, and now, nowadays, with drone technology, it can uh, can provide a panoramic view of the uh, the damage. Um, and also, with social media, we have um, you know a lot of wealth of knowledge um, from eyewitnesses. Um, and and definitely, we would encourage you if you have reports, be sure to um, send them to us um, either through social media or sending in a storm report. And Rodney, I'll just add, um, for the storm surveys, it's kind of like we're playing detectives. So we're using these three parts, the radar data, the on, what we see on site, and what we hear from eyewitnesses um, to kind of put the puzzle together as to what's happened. And sometimes it's very easy to tell right off the bat that there was a tornado. Um, example would be Springfield in 2011 out over to Munson. Um, sometimes it's a little harder to tell, especially with an EF0. So sometimes we can't tell right on site and give an answer. Sometimes we go back to the office um, and kind of have a discussion among the staff based upon the evidence that we have um, before making our decision. So. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, and the key thing to remember about whether there's a tornado on the ground, it's not so much some, uh, in terms of the, the amount of damage, but the pattern of damage. Um, and, and we would contrast this with a, a microburst uh, in, the, in the, the next slide. Um, when an area has been affected by a tornado, the damage is usually uh, chaotic, um, and you usually get trees that are kind of um, crisscrossing one another. Um, and that's just because of the rotational signature of the storm. Um, and see the next slide. And and this slide really shows you the. Um, the distinction between a microburst and a tornado. 
So on the left, you have the tornado damage in Munstern um, from 2011. You can see this, the trees were kind of just toppled in all directions, very chaotic. But for a microburst event that, in fact, this was a drone, drone footage taken uh, just two months ago in Western, you can see the, the trees were all lined up in the same direction. And that's indicative of a microburst. So let's uh, do a quick storm survey together. So the scenario is, you know, we had severe thunderstorms the previous evening. There were reports of downed trees and damage to homes. Um, the radar shows some rotational signature and the local EM um, say that she saw some twisting in the damage pattern. So because this was a suspected tornado, um, we went ahead to do a storm survey. And one thing to note is that the storm survey is um, it's not an exact science, um, but we do have a, a reference, a guide to kind of, um, you know, based on the, the amount and extent of damage, um, you know, what kind of wind speed was on the ground. And that's what we call a damage degree indicator. And in this case, there were uh, reports of uprooted maple trees. And, and based on the indicator, uh, we can expect a wind speed of 91 miles per hour, but the range could be between 76 to 118 miles per hour, depend, depending on the extent of damage observed. And also importantly, the health of the tree, because obviously if you have a tree that is kind of rotting from the inside, it doesn't take much to topper it. So let's just use 80 miles per hour, um, since many trees did not appear to be that healthy. There were also minor damage to a house, and that would give us an expected wind speed of 79 miles per hour. And again, there's a range from 63 to 97 miles per hour, depending on the extent of damage and how well built the house is. But let's just use 79 miles per hour for this scenario. So summarizing what we had, we had estimated wind from the uprooted trees, about 80 miles per hour. Estimated wind from the house, 79 miles per hour. Um, and remember how I, what I said about um, the pattern of damage being more important than the amount of damage. And in this case, there were convergent damage to the trees. So the trees were kind of falling on top of each other. And we had an eyewitness say, saying that this debris swirling in the air. So we're pretty confident that's a tornado, but what is the rating? And we looked at the, uh, the EF scale, the enhanced Fujita scale, um, 80 mile per hour, that's EF zero. And so what are some of the more significant tornadoes that have occurred in Southern New England? And at this time, I would pass it back to Joe, who would um, enlighten you with uh, our, some of our more significant tornadoes. Okay, thanks, Rodney. And of course, um, uh, the one that everybody seems to remember is the, uh, the Worcester tornado of 1953, which we will get to. Um, but we have a lot of events that we just want to kind of take you through. Uh, so the earliest known tornado outbreak was actually back in 1787. Uh, it was back uh, on August 15th, so actually the anniversary of that is coming up. Um, there were at least five tornadoes. Uh, you can see them listed here in Connecticut and Massachusetts and even in, in New Hampshire. Uh, there were many injuries, uh, but only two fatalities occurred um, as the tornadoes passed through many uninhabited areas, but tree damage was described as very extensive. Now, how do we know about that? Well, a lot of people in the colonial times and the revolutionary period had weather journals. So um, a lot of these tornadoes were actually recorded. Um, people reported whirlwinds and things like that. Um, in some cases, an elephant's trunk, uh, you know, a cloud 
feature. So uh, going back to people's weather journals, they're able to actually recreate um, you know where these storms were. So if you follow our um, This Day in Weather History and social media, you'll see a lot of these events, especially from the colonial period through the revolutionary times in the 1800s. So um, there's a number of them also coming up um, in August, which you'll see on social media. So let's go a little bit closer to the current time. Well, Worcester, of course, June 9th, 1953. This is probably one of the most famous tornadoes in southern New England, which caused extensive damage. And this was rated an F4. Um, in fact, if we looked at the Boston Globe the uh, the day before, the forecast was actually for thunderstorms. Uh, so back, you know, this is the early 1950s, not today with the Internet and everyone can look at model data. Um, wasn't a bad forecast of thunderstorms. And actually, um, we have some um, information from our office and the archives about some discussions that took place the day before. Um, the staff actually knew the history of the weather system. For those of you who are familiar with the weather uh, the day before, there was actually a tornado outbreak in Michigan, um, which was kind of the precursor to what happened in Worcester the next day. So meteorologist on duty, Al Flayhive, um, and other staff met um, to discuss the forecast at 10 o'clock on June 8th uh, to discuss the mention of tornado for their next forecast issuance uh, because they knew what had happened in Michigan the day before and knew there was at least a chance of that happening uh, the next day, but they decided against it because they didn't want to be unnecessarily alarming. Um, back in the 50s, using the word tornado um, was thought to possibly incite panic um, and confusion. So it was really not a term that was used very much at all. So instead, they opted for the first ever um, forecast with severe thunderstorm wor uh, wording in it at 1130, which was windy, partly cloudy, hot and humid with thunderstorms, some locally severe. That was the first time that was used in a forecast for New England. So the weather map on June 9th, um, this was actually from the Worcester Weather Bureau office, uh, showed you know classic pattern, uh, which was actually not too unlike what happened in June uh, 2011. Warm front lifted north of the area, hot and humid air. This was a little bit of a trough, wind shift line ahead of the main cold front um, that sparked the thunderstorms. And that afternoon there was um, three inch hail and what was called rotating wind damage in coal rain mass and baseball hail reported in Northfield Mass around 3.45 p.m., um, just prior to the Worcester tornado. Next, what we're looking at is actually a radar image taken at 4.55 p.m. This was from a MIT radar in Lexington, Massachusetts, and this hook echo, which you're probably familiar with as a signature for a tornado, um, was actually seen on the radar that day. This is over Holden, Mass. And what was happening in Holden that day? Well, lo and behold, uh, a big tornado. This is actually a photograph from Tom Grizzoulis' book on, on tornadoes, um, showing the tornado over Holden, Massachusetts. Now, this photo is probably the most famous uh, one of the Worcester tornado. It was taken um, near Shrewsbury, um, and you can see a well-defined funnel. This is obviously a very large tornado um, occurring at the time. So uh, that was what happened afterwards, after uh, that afternoon. So from the Weather Bureau st uh, standpoint, what was going on? Well, there was a phone call made after five o'clock from Blue Hill Observatory to the Boston Weather Bureau um, talking about debris falling out of the sky. Um, and the quote there, it's coming from great heights, shingles, small branches, paper, boards, several feet long. I'm afraid there's been a bad tornado somewhere. So the forecaster uh, Drebert in Boston agreed and issued the first ever tornado warning in New England. Uh, mentioning caution is advised on severe thunderstorms with isolated tornado activity in the Boston area between 6 and 8 p.m. this evening. And that was sent via teletype at 545. So after the tornado was done, uh, unfortunately, but um, at that point, you know, they weren't sure the days of, of communication weren't like they are today. Um, so a warning was issued based upon that. And actually that day, there were three other tornadoes in addition to the Worcester tornado. There was an F1 tornado up in um, New Hampshire, actually two of them, an F1 and F3. And then another tornado just to the southeast of the Worcester tornado from Sutton to Northern Mansfield in Massachusetts. Uh, so there were actually four different tornadoes on that day. Uh, the strongest of them obviously was the tornado that moved through Worcester. So the final statistics for that, it was F4 damage um, on the ground, 84 minutes, a path length of 46 miles and a width up to one mile. That was a very, that's a very large tornado by our standards. Um, there were 94 fatalities and nearly 1,300 injuries and about 4,000 buildings destroyed. And of note, um, debris was actually found in the Boston area and on Cape Cod. Um, a frozen mattress was found in Massachusetts Bay near Weymouth. 
and books and clothing were found at Blue Hill and also on the outer part of Cape Cod near Provincetown, Chatham, and Eastham. So debris was lofted well up into the air and thrown, uh, you know, many, many miles uh, to the east. So moving on in time, um, this was August 1972. Some of you may remember this, especially in the in the greater Boston area. There were three tornadoes that day, an F1 in Wilbraham um, that really just uprooted dozens of trees. And that's pretty typical for our tornadoes. Um, they tend to just uproot down trees and occasionally some damage to houses and other structures. There was an F2 from Templeton to Winchenden um, around 3 o'clock. That traveled 10 miles. Um, did a little bit more damage, uh, trees, wires, and buildings, and there was one injury with that. And then in, in Metro Boston, a tornado traveled seven miles from Needham through Newton to Brookline. That was an F1. Um, there was one fatality um, and six injuries in Chestnut Hill from falling debris. Again, most of the damage there was to trees and some homes. And there's a photo uh, of the damage in Brookline of some of the tree damage. So we're going to move forward in time, and now an, another storm. This was uh, our tornado. This was probably one of the more famous ones as well. The Windsor Locks tornado. This was an F4, um, October 3rd, 1979. Um, and this was one of the worst tornadoes in Connecticut's history. Um, pretty much struck without warning, and given the unusual time of year in, in the early fall, the initial reports were of an explosion, not of a tornado. Um, there were three fatalities and about 500 injuries. Um, 100 homes were nearly leveled, and about 30 aircraft were destroyed at Bradley Airport in Windsor Locks, and including the Air Museum uh, there. Uh, this was, you know, a fall tornado. We get them. We had, a, we had some in 2018, which I'll discuss. Um, so there's actually a secondary peak for tornadoes in the, in the early fall. Um, you're still getting, you're getting a strong contrast with the, the colder air moving in. There's usually a lot more of the wind shear that Rodney talked about. So um, that can be favorable for, you know, tornadoes late in the season. In 1986, um, three tornadoes struck Rhode Island. Um, probably the most well-known of those was the one that went through Cranston and Providence. Um, but there was, uh, this was the only multi-tornado day in the history of the state of Rhode Island. Um, first, there was an F1 tornado in Cumberland in the northern part of the state, traveled a half mile, damaged the trees and power lines. Um, but the strongest was this F2 tornado around 4.15 p.m., which traveled four miles um, through Cranston and Providence. And you can see a damaged photo there on the right from the Providence Journal. Um, it flipped a truck, moved a house off its foundation, and took the top floor off of the building that you see on the right. Um, 20 people were injured, mostly from flying debris. Um, and then the next morning, there was an F1 tornado in Burrowville, which traveled six miles toward North Smithfield, uh, damaged several cars, a building, and a trailer. And we actually have uh, a web page on this. If you go to our website, um, weather.gov slash Boston, and do 1986 underscore tornado, um, you can find out more information about these tornadoes that struck Rhode Island. Now into the 2000s, um, we had an F1 tornado in Princeton, Mass. Some of you may remember this. This was from the remains of Tropical Storm Allison, which, which passed uh, offshore south of New England, actually off the coast. This was actually on Father's Day, Sunday morning. Uh, wind damage was reported in Shirley, Lancaster, and Sterling. But this F1 tornado, you can actually see the track here on, the, um, on this aerial photo, um, started with mostly in a wooded area, so just damaged the trees and lifted just short of these residences. So fortunately, no one was injured. Uh, there was just damage really to, to trees. But here's the radar signature, and you can see this kind of a circulation. You can almost see this in its reflectivity. And of course, in the velocity data, the blues against the reds are always uh, bad news. That's pretty strong rotation. So this was a very quick, uh, you know, only lasted a few minutes, very typical of our southern New England tornadoes. They don't last too long, but they can cause quite a bit of damage. Now we go on to June 1st, 2011. I'm sure many of you remember this day. Uh, this was an EF3, very similar to the Worcester tornado, and the environment actually was very similar. Um, it was typical of almost a, a Plains-type severe weather day, a lot of instability, a lot of shear, um, and what are called steep lapse rates, where it's the temperature change from, say, the surface on up several thousand feet. Um, so this was, uh, you know, if you were in the plains, you'd, you'd probably say, okay, it's a typical spring severe weather day. For us here in New England, this is probably once in a 50 to 60 year event. Um, you know, before Springfield, the last tornado of this caliber was the Worcester tornado. So, um, you know, for, for many of us, this is, you know, once in a lifetime event. Um, this was rated EF3. It was the high end of EF3. And you can see a couple of photos. On the left is from Munson, Massachusetts. And on the right is the tornado actually going through downtown Springfield, crossing the Connecticut River. 
So the track of this tornado, uh, there were actually a couple of others that day. This was the main one that went through Springfield and Munson, Brimfield, and lifted in Southbridge. But there was also another tornado in Wilbraham, one in Brimfield as well. Uh, I believe those were F1s. If you looked at satellite data, um, you know, even to this day, you can see a little bit of this ground scarring here um, along the path of the tornado where the trees were just pretty much uprooted and, and debarked for the most part. Uh, so this was, you know, one of the stronger tornadoes we had. And on the damage survey, whenever we have a, a major tornado that can, is possibly an EF4 or EF5, we have to have a national expert on uh, wind damage um, join us on the storm survey. And we did for this particular one. The only time in my 30-year career I've had, I've had to go through that. But um, this was a two-day storm survey, two full days um, to actually check out. And we had two different teams on the ground deployed to look at all the damage. So... Uh, you know, I personally never thought I'd see any damage like this. This looked like literally, especially in Munson, a bomb went off, uh, just so much damage. And for those of you who remember the radar, we didn't have the dual pole that we could show some of the other things, but we had the typical what's called a debris ball. This is actually some of the debris being lofted into the air um, associated with the tornado. And you can see very strong rotation, um, bright orange against the, the greens here. Um, and this is at a distance from the radar. This is looking, you know, a few thousand feet up. Um, so this was very, very strong rotation. You can see there was actually another supercell to the north of uh, of the Springfield tornado. So why didn't this one um, develop as much? Well, because this storm was taking all the energy and taking all the, the inflow, it's called, um, to strengthen its updraft, where it was disturbing kind of the circulation around this supercell. So there were two smaller tornadoes, but nothing to the extreme of that EF3. And some of the damage photos uh, you can see from the air, lots of damage to structures, uh, downtown Springfield, many buildings damaged, destroyed, houses destroyed um, throughout the area. In Wilbraham, uh, some of the most high-end damage occurred. This was the high-end EF3 trees uprooted, flattened. Many of them were debarked. Uh, and this is in Munson, too. Many houses were just totally destroyed in this one neighborhood. Uh, in Munson, you can see many of the trees just snapped off or completely ha have no bark left on them. And again, here's a shot of the tornado in Munson. And notice it looks pretty similar to the Worcester tornado, doesn't it? I and mean, this is almost, you could say this is almost an identical photo, very, very similar. So again, probably what would, I would call a once in a 50 or once in a 60 year event, uh, the Springfield tornado of June 1st, 2011. Changing gears now, in 2012, Block Island, uh, there was the first recorded touchdown of a tornado. Um, and for the most part, tornado records go back to the 1950s. But um, this was an EF0. Um, it was initially a water spout. Um, it's, if you can see Block Island here, it may be hard to see. But um, there's actually a circulation, green against the red, showing our, our circulation with that storm. It was a water spout that moved on shore and caused some tree damage. Um, but it counts. So uh, Block Island had its first EF0 with a maximum wind of 70 miles per hour. That was in 2012. Moving to 2014, um, this was the Revere Mass EF2. Um, this actually occurred in the morning um, and was rated with max winds of 120 miles per hour. It had a path length of two miles and about a, almost a half mile path width. No injuries or fatalities, fortunately. Um, and this was only on the ground for four minutes. Again, very typical of our Southern New England tornadoes. They're not on the ground for 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, you know, the Springfield tornado aside, that's the exception. Most of these are maybe five to 10 minutes. They come down, cause damage, and lift right back up again. So um, you need to, that's why we always say you need to be weather aware when we say there's a potential for tornadoes. They can sometimes strike without warning. Here's a look at the radar images from the Revere tornado. Nothing really shows up, you know, uh, if you're looking at what's called our reflectivity, it looks like just a, a lot of heavy rain, maybe some thunder embedded. But lo and behold, there were actually two circulations. Um, and it, if, if I were to loop this forward, it was these two circulations that came together and formed the tornado right over Revere. So at the time, forecasters were really concerned about flash flooding in Boston, which did happen. Um, but at the same time, we had these two circulations and they just merged together and dropped a, a very short lived EF2 tornado. And here's a close-up um, looking at the circulation. And again, this is using what we call correlation coefficient, and it just shows the uniformity of what the radar is measuring. So when you see a, a circulation like this coupled with um, a lowering you know, of this, what we call CC, that's indicative of tornado debris. It's called a tornado debris signature and essentially confirms a tornado is on the ground. So at this point, um, we were seeing 
there was obviously a tornado and damn uh, debris was being lofted into the air so that's the signal you will see on the radar moving forward to 2016 uh, there was an ef1 tornado in concord massachusetts some of the damage photos there a lot again a lot of tree damage and this one actually occurred in the middle of the night um, it touched down at 3:20 in the morning and only the fifth tornado on record to have occurred in massachusetts between midnight and 6 a.m uh, the last one was in the 70s i believe 1975. it had maximum winds of 100 miles per hour um, again short path length half mile and only a 400 yard path width so a short touchdown um, but did quite a bit of damage and if this loop will work, you can actually see, uh, here's the reflectivity. You're not seeing too much in here, but if you look to the, to the right, you can see a good circulation, red against green, going right through Concord. And that's the short tornado touchdown. And something else we look at here too, uh, is the rotation tracks uh, that we can look at from the radar. So it shows areas of you know, weaker rotation in the yellows, but stronger rotation in the reds. And this is associated actually with the track of the tornado as it moved through Concord. So it's something else we look at in the radar. The one thing about the Concord tornado was this was one of the first times we had the, what's called the wireless emergency alerts. Um, you get the warnings on your cell phone for tornado warnings. And actually it woke people up in the middle of the night. It, it worked. Um, and a lot of people, their cell phones went off. They got up, they went to, they saw the tornado warning and they went to a safe place in their house, basement or an interior room on the lowest floor. And we heard about it the next day on social media. People got the warning, they took action, and nobody was injured uh, or at all. So um, a good success story for the middle of the night, which can be a very bad time for tornadoes. In 2018, it was kind of our banner year uh, for tornadoes here. We had a number of them. Uh, through Douglas and Upton, Mass., this was an EF1 tornado. Uh, and again, another one in the middle of the night, 2.30 in the morning. Um, it was an EF1 with winds of 100 miles per hour. This one traveled a little bit farther, about four and a half miles. Uh, and a path width of 200 yards, but again, no injuries, no deaths. Uh, the wireless emergency alerts um, helped once again, woke people up, got them to take shelter before the storm hit. And this is just a look at the radar uh, at the time. You don't see too much, looks kind of innocuous, but there is a little bit of a curl here, um, and that was it. Sometimes we don't see too much on the radar at all. Um, zooming up a little bit, you can see, you know, there's no real indication of a hook, just kind of a broad area of heavy rain, maybe some sort of, you know, appendage looking feature. Uh, but you can certainly see on the right, there's your rotation, your tight, uh, you know, your greens against your reds. We call it tight and bright, and that's the indication for a tornado. Moving on to August 4th of 2018, this was Dudley and Webster, Mass. This was an, an EF1 that caused quite a bit of damage, especially in Webster, Mass. Uh, this one was an EF1, winds of 110 miles per hour. Again, short path length, half mile, and only 300 yards width. Uh, that was the track. Um, there was one injury from falling debris. Um, this one occurred at about 10 in the morning. It was a Saturday morning when this one um, occurred. But there was warning in advance, uh, so people were able to take action. Uh, here's looking at differences in circulation. This is about three minutes prior on the left. You can see you've got greens, you've got reds, but they're really not close together. Uh, at the time of the tornado, we kind of seen the same thing, but this is very circular in its pattern. So this is, even though it's not right against one another, the greens and the reds, um, this circular uh, kind of pattern to it is indicative of a tornado. Now we move on. This was October of the same year. So, you know, not only enough during the summer, but we had actually a bit of an outbreak here in Massachusetts and Rhode Island um, in the fall. So there were actually four um, different tornadoes, which we'll go through briefly here. Uh, the first was Lincoln in North Providence. This was an EF1 with winds between 90 and 100 miles per hour, downed a lot of trees. Um, one neighborhood in Lincoln actually had, there were some houses that sustained minor damage, but for the most part, a lot of snapped or uprooted trees, path length of about a mile and a half, which was discontinuous. The tornado skipped a little bit, but um, no injuries or deaths. Here's a look at the radar. Um, so what we're looking at, this is your reflectivity, and you see that hook pattern. Um, here's your velocity. You're looking at the greens against the reds. And this is that CC I was talking about. It's a little noisy, but you can kind of make out there's a lowering in that same area in blue, and that's showing debris uh, in that area. Then over to Norton, Mass., this was actually about a mile north of our office. You can see the radar in the black circle here, so we can't see it too well. But you can see a, a hook shape here. Here's your velocity, your greens against your reds, and a lowering in the CC. This passed 
just north of our new facility, which we had just moved into that year. So we're thankful that there was no damage. Again, mostly damage to trees. This was an EF1 with winds of 90 to 95 miles per hour. Also the same day, um, there was an EF1 in Hardwick, Mass, further to the west. This one you're not going to see as well on the radar because the radar beam is sampling a little bit higher up into the storm. It's probably about five or 6,000 feet. Um, so you're not seeing much on the reflectivity, but definitely there's some circulation there. Um, not tight and bright, but it's there. Um, and in the CC, you know, not much showing up at all. But this was an EF1, um, similar to the Norton tornado, 90 to 95 miles per hour uh, were the max winds and a path length of just under one mile. And not to be outdone, we actually had one in Hubbardston, Mass, an EF0. Uh, this was winds of 70 to 80 miles per hour. With a lot of our EF0s, it's not always a great radar signature. You can make out a little bit of a kind of maybe a pendant or um, appendage here in the reflectivity. You can see a little bit in the velocity, but not much and nothing really in RCC. Um, so again, the weaker tornado, but did path length of a mile and down some, some trees and uprooted some trees in Hubbardston. Then on the 2019, uh, many of you I'm sure remember this day, um, I certainly do, we had um, a number of EF1 tornadoes on Cape Cod uh, during the morning, just from really one supercell thunderstorm. These are, this is the rotational track that I was showing earlier, and you can see we had a very long-lived storm that started off south of New England over the water, uh, moved up into Vineyard Sound, passed just to the west of Martha's Vineyard, um, moved just east of Woods Hole um, into really Calmus Beach and then caused its damage here on Cape Cod. So at 10.47 a.m., we actually, uh, this was well before, the storm was over the water, just about to enter Vineyard Sound. Um, we, looking at this data, you can see a water spout is likely occurring at this time based upon the strong uh, velocity data. Um, you can see this is on the right is called normalized rotation. So it's the higher the, ro the value, the higher the rotation. Um, you can see a little bit of a circulation in the reflectivity, and you know you could argue there's a lowering here. Maybe that's some spray being lifted up, um, but it's hard to tell. But at this point, there's probably a water spout going on, but really nobody's there to witness it. Um, just before 12 o'clock, the tornado did pass through Woods Hole, and we did have a photo of a water spout from the Steamship Authority. And then at 12 o'clock, um, the tornado touched down occurred in Yarmouth, um, and this was a radar confirmed tornado. So we have our reflectivity. You're not seeing much of a hook, but a little bit of what we call an appendage. There's a very strong velocity couplet with the yellows against the, the blues almost that's forming. Um, and at this point, you also have the lowering of the CC. So this is where the tornado touched down and was producing some damage in Yarmouth. At 12.10 p.m., there's another tornado touchdown in Harwich. Um, again, this is a, a large, you know, almost a, it's not really a hook, but it's, it's almost its own storm with its own circulation. Um, you can see the very tight um, and bright uh, velocity couplet there on the upper right, um, and a little bit here near where it says East Harwich of a lowering of the CC, which is some debris being lofted into the air. So just to, to summarize, and uh, Rodney, I, actually, I will let you do this because I'm almost out of breath. So why don't you finish up and we'll talk about uh, a couple of safety tips. Sure, thank you, Joe. Um, so just to summarize, um, in terms of messaging, um, you know, it's very important to distinguish between a watch and a warning. Typically, and ideally, um, a tornado watch should um, follow, should precede a tornado warning. And, uh, and if you were to take some of our other other uh, webinars, um, you would have known that um, we, um, as a as a forecast, local forecast office, we collaborate with the Storm Prediction Center, which is based in uh, Norman, Oklahoma, to um, to you know issue uh, severe thunderstorm watch and tornado watch um, if we think that the environment is ripe for a more widespread um, severe thunderstorm outbreak. Um, but this is not necessarily the case in you know in in events where you know there's, there's an isolated tornado and then we have to issue a short fuse tornado and that's when the the, uh, the weir um, comes into play you get alerts and uh, you can react um, accordingly but you know a tornado watch is be prepared a tornado is possible the ingredients are there um, and you know use the time to have a plan you know, if you live in a mobile home, uh, mobile homes, I must emphasize, are not um, 
safe shelters in the event of a tornado. You would need something more concrete, and so you would have to look for alternative shelters. Um, if you know, it would tell you that the environment is favorable for tornadoes. When you get a tornado warning, uh, that is not a time for you to go outside and take videos and uh, of the tornado. Immediately head to the the safest shelter that you can find. Um, and hunker down, wait until the storm is over, um, and you know, save your life. Um, so to find out more about thunderstorm safety, our, our website is a great resource. Um, just go to weather.gov slash Boston, um, and then under safety, go to tornadoes, um, and you can read um, all about tornado safety um, and other um, things as well. So thank you so much for listening into the presentation. Uh, we will now take uh, questions um, and I will pass it back to Joe. Okay, thanks Rodney. So we'll, let's go through and uh, we have plenty of time to answer some questions here. So let's see, uh, Jimmy, question from Jimmy, how do you determine if it was a microburst or tornado? I think we covered that pretty well, Jimmy. So again, um, you look, we look for essentially the twisting debris in the tornado and more of straight line, you know, trees all fallen in the same direction for uh, the microburst. But we also use radar data. We also use eyewitness reports as well to help us uh, confirm that. And he has a follow-up question. Was there a tornado last Thursday, 723 in Andover, Mass? Um, no, there wasn't. Um, there were a few funnel clouds, uh, I believe, that day. And Rodney actually is working on an event review of July 23rd, and we plan to actually present that. Um, probably in a couple of weeks, so stay tuned for that. But um, all of the damage with that was, was straight line wind damage, even though there were a couple of reports of funnel clouds, um, nothing touched down. Question from Mark, tornado damage report shows columns, EXP, LB, UB. So again, that's what we use um, when we're out on a survey um, to determine the wind speed. So what we're doing is we're looking at damage and we estimate a wind speed based on that damage. And from knowing the wind speed, then we can assign an EF rating if it's a tornado. So EXP is expected. That will be a wind speed that you would, would expect to see based upon that kind of damage. LB is a lower bound, meaning um, if you know the trees were weakened, if the construction of the house wasn't really up to par, you know, if it's a an old barn or an old outbuilding, for example, we might use the lower bound as a kind of a lower estimate of the wind speed. Whereas on the opposite, an upper bound might be for some pretty impressive damage um, that we feel is above that expected value. So we actually have three values that we look at um, when we go out and do our storm damage surveys. Question from Peter, what is a tornado family? That is typically um, a number of tornadoes that can be spawned you know, from the same supercell. Um, occasionally a supercell can drop one tornado um, then the tornado would lift, then we can have, a, you know, kind of what we call recycles itself and another tornado forms. So uh, it's a number of tornadoes kind of spawned by the same, uh, by the same storm. Let's see, moving on. Uh, from Katie, there was a tornado on 29 June 89 in Hamden, Connecticut. Uh, that is correct. I did not include that because we had a lot, but actually we do have a social media post on that. Uh, from June. So every June that one will go out, but there was a tornado in that area down near New Haven. Um, from Bill, the Lincoln Rhode Island tornado, I think, ah, we did cover that. And he says, yes, ah, we did. Um, let's see, Mark, difference between two radar echoes side by side. Not sure what you mean. Um, if we're looking at, if we're looking at reflectivity, uh, if there are two different storms or if we're looking at velocity, so velocity, we're looking for a couplet, strong inbound, which is typically the greens, and a strong outbound, which is typically the reds. Um, that's typically, what, so we look at reflectivity, we look at, you know, to see if there's any kind of pattern, usually we look for the hook. Um, but most often we're looking at the velocity data to see the actual rotational couplet, see the strength of it, uh, to determine, you know, if we need to issue a tornado warning. So Mark, if I didn't answer your question, feel free to email me or, or throw another one in. Uh, question from Ethan, uh, is the info of damage on different buildings shown earlier on the NWS web website? It'd be a nice reference. Yeah, we're actually working on a web page of the Southern New England tornadoes. So some of those tracks that you saw uh, are from that. That's a work in progress, Ethan. So I'm hoping uh, to have that either later this year or by the spring. Um, we're gonna have one of our forecasters work on that and have a, 
kind of a tornado uh, reference page, and we can include some of the uh, different damage indicators as well. So good suggestion. Question from Patricia, and I'll throw this one to Rodney to give myself a break. Does the ocean have an impact on severe storm development? Yes, absolutely. Especially earlier on in the spring when the ocean temperature is still in the, the 40s and 50s, um, you know, uh, the, the cold ocean temperatures would lead to a cooler, you know, air temperature above the ocean. And, and when that happens, you, you get kind of like an inversion. And, and for storms to fire up, you need the temperatures to, um, to fall with increasing height. But in an inversion, you have the temperature actually rise with height, at least for the first 1,000 to 2,000 feet. And that would just, you know, kind of cut off any um, updraft and um, storm development. So, but, you know, as we progress into June and July, um, places like Eastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island come into play because the sea surface temperature increase uh, to 60s and 70s. So in a nutshell, yes, the oceans um, do play a big role in um, severe storms development, especially earlier on in the spring. Right. And Rodney, I should also mention that the Cape Cod tornadoes um, occurred in July. The um, actual sea surface temperatures were fairly warm. I believe they were in the upper 70s. Um, so that actually helped to energize that one supercell that moved up. It was actually developed off of Long Island, off Montauk Point earlier that morning. So in this case, the ocean actually helped. It provided a little bit more energy. Good question. All right, from Joshua, can you get a tornado with a microburst? Yes, you can. And in fact, sometimes when we do storm surveys, we um, we find out there was a tornado and also microburst damage. So um, separate from the tornado, if you remember the diagram that Rodney had showed, that, that rear flank downdraft. So that's, that's the air, the downdraft coming um, out behind actually what the tornado is that can actually produce damage on its own and produce winds of you know 60 70 sometimes 80 miles per hour um, so yes you can have both and that frequently will actually occur from jackie how come some funnel clouds don't touch down good question and um actually the, some research that uh, has come out in the past few years has shown you need to have um you know for for our tornadoes here in new england we've done we've studied them quite a bit so we're getting better at being able to kind of tell when conditions are are favorable for them um, we need to have a lot of like tropical moisture so think of those you know really kind of humid days where the where the dew point is 70 or higher it's really sticky um, that helps the cloud actually um, come down closer to the surface um, but also we need that what we called about that wind shear and what you really need is the wind shear in the lowest few hundred or about a thousand feet. Um, if you don't have the strong wind shear right down near the ground level, um, you can't connect or, or get really that funnel cloud to touch down to the ground. So um, the past couple of weeks we've had reports of funnel clouds and that's really been the reason why. We've had good wind shear kind of aloft at the cloud level but not so much down near the ground and we need to have a little bit more of that shear down near the ground level in order to get the funnel cloud to touch down to become a tornado. So good question. And um, there's actually been a lot of research on that here in New England. Um, I've done that with our office in Albany and New York. We're actually working on a project now to kind of uh, understand our tornadoes a little bit uh, since they are much more different than those in the Midwest. Um, June 1st aside, of course. All right, from Ronald. With tropical storms coming up the coast, such as Isaias, and that's how we pronounce it, is it true that these storms can produce weaker tornadoes as a result of the feeder bands? Yes, absolutely. Um, typically, if, and if I refer you, please go to our um, webinar on Hurricanes 101 um, or Tropical Weather 101. We actually talk about that a little bit. Most of the tornadoes occur on the northern and eastern side of the center of, of the um, tropical storm or hurricane. So um, it's that eastern side of the storm that's most dangerous um, as these bands ahead of the eye move up into the area. So typically when we have a storm, um, say if you remember Irene, which actually came inland, um, the, the, you know, as that storm was coming up the coast, we actually had people on watching the radar here for possible tornadoes in those bands well out in advance of the storm. So again, with the, the tropical storm, it's normally just north and especially you know northeast and east of the center is where um, tornadoes are favored. That, not always weaker, they sometimes can pack a punch, but that's where they're most likely to occur in a tropical storm or hurricane. Good question. 
Robert has a question. What is the best website to observe the Boston dual pole Doppler radar? Typically, um, you'd want to use uh, either you can use an, a, a cell phone app or um, we use a program. The National Weather Service uses a program called GR2 Analyst. Um, obviously, we can't endorse a, a particular program being the, the federal government, but um, there are radar programs out there. If you just do a, a search online, um, you can find one. Just you know, search dual pole Doppler radar data, and I'm sure you'll come up with a bunch of different options, but they are out there um, for you to look at. From Eric, what forecast tools are available at longer ranges, like 24 to 48 hours prior, for tornadoes such as Revere or Cape Cod that aren't directly associated with an organized severe weather outbreak? Um, I can uh, start, and Rodney, you can finish. Um, well, right now, what we have um, are we have what are called um, high-resolution models. So they are really good for these smaller-scale weather events. We use them from anything from um, heavy snow bands and winter storms to severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. Um, these are fairly new, maybe the past really three to four years, um, and they're constantly being improved. So we have access to those now. We didn't have those really for Revere. Um, we did for Cape Cod, and we knew that the environment was favorable. Um, so we're pretty much looking at, at these higher resolution models from 24 to 48 hours, even 12 hours out. Um, to get an idea of the environment that's favorable. And again, we want the instability. We want the wind shear. We want that high moisture. Those are kind of the three ingredients that we look at, but they really have to all come together uh, to be favorable to produce severe weather. Rodney, anything to add on that? Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, and thank you, Eric, for the question. Um, yeah, and I can, we can actually recommend you a, a website to go to because this is actually um, um, a storm prediction center website. Um, and the website, the URL is um, uh, spc.noaa.gov slash um, exper, ex like experiment, slash href, href. That's basically the website for the high resolution um, ensemble uh, forecast. And this product is, is, is very useful because um, and you, when you explore the website, you would see it is very visual, uh, visually appealing, and um, it goes up 48 hours. And basically, uh, it is an ensemble of um, of five different high resolution models um, up that you know go out to 48 hours. And if you play around with the website, um, and feel free to ask, um, send us questions how to use the website. Um, you know, there's um, there's a section where you can see what's the probability of tornadoes, uh, hail, and severe wind, um, you know, by every four hours or every 24 hours, and um, it, it can give you a pretty good idea um, the, the severe type of severe threat that we, we face. And even as forecasters, we actually use that website as well. So uh, it, it goes to show how much how useful the website is. And uh, yeah, and Eric, um, I would also encourage you, go to our YouTube video page. We have a, a webinar we recently uh, conducted, it's called Severe Weather 202, that goes through a lot of the forecast tools that we have, even going from you know eight days before right up to the day of the event. So that's called Severe Weather 202, and it's in our YouTube video page. Good question. Next one from Paul is, are you using drones extensively for your storm surveys nowadays? Um, we're using them more. Um, we, the National Weather Service doesn't, you know, our office doesn't own a drone, but um, we have partners, our TV meteorologist partners, um, Skywarn Amateur Radio, some of those observers have them. Um, so if we can get access to some drone footage, we certainly will take it. Um, but, you know, a lot of times we still need to do the boots on the ground and actually go check out the damage itself. So it's, it's certainly a very useful um, tool. In, in the past, we'd have to use, um, we, we would, you know, have Massachusetts State Police helicopters do a flyover for us and take pictures or Civil Air Patrol um, help us out with photos. But now with drones, um, it's certainly a lot easier to get that footage and, and a lot faster, too. So we are using them. And I would expect in the next few years we will be relying on them a little bit more and more. So good question. Uh, from Kevin, uh, was there rotation about a week ago with a cell coming out of New Hampshire into Eastern Mass? And I believe that was the 23rd, Rodney. Um, yeah, there was. Um, and I believe it produced a funnel cloud. Uh, in that case, that was up near Newburyport, I believe. Um, 
the one thing with all most storms do show some sort of rotation so it's important to note that um, it's it really when we talk about tornadoes we're talking about the, the the strength of the rotation the depth of the rotation through the storm um, and the persistence it has to be a persistent signature so really those three are the things are the keys that we look at um, when we're talk when we're considering anyway um, some sort of tornado warning uh, for the storm so good question and we should have a, and we will be doing an event review for that um, probably in a couple of weeks. So let's see, next question. You've discussed this from Robert. You have, may have discussed this prior, but why do tropical storms seem to spawn more tornadoes, but hurricanes not as many? Um, good, that's a good question. Um, a lot of times the tropical storms, um, it's, you know, just depends. Um, you know, they, they both, we've certainly had more tropical storms make landfall than hurricanes on the East Coast. Um, you know, sometimes the damage, you, you can't separate it from the actual damage from the hurricane. Um, but yeah, good question, Robert. Um, you know, they're both, they both have banded features. Um, a lot of times, you know, when the storm is weakening, um, it still has that spin to it. And it's that spin um, that can produce tornadoes. So if you remember the one I, I talked about of June 2001, Tropical Storm Allison was actually um, weakening, but still had just enough spin in the atmosphere to, to generate a tornado. So, um, you know, typically, I think there were just more recorded cases of uh, tornadoes with tropical storms than with hurricanes. A good question. Bill has a question. Will you be doing something that's similar on hurricanes? Yes, we actually did. It was called Tropical Weather 101, Bill. Um, go check our YouTube video page. It is recorded and available. So. We have that. Uh, let's see, from Michael, back a couple of years ago in October, you mentioned a cluster of tornadoes. That was 2018. Wasn't there a related severe thunderstorm which set the Baptist Church in Wakefield ablaze? Um, I believe that was, I don't know if that was the same number of storms, but I do remember that. I believe it was the same year. Um, it's possible that was the same um, severe weather day. I just, off the top of my head, I, I can't recall that, Michael. Um, Question, question from Kevin again. Do pulse storms definitely mean a cell is raining itself out or weakening? Rodney, you want to take that one on pulse storms? Sure, Joe. Um, yeah, pulse storms um, typically happen when there's, um, you know, not a lot of wind shear um, or wind even um, available. Um, so you, uh, some of you may remember, um, was it? Probably a month ago, there was, um, you know, we were, I think we declared a drought in the area, and there was this isolated uh, thunderstorms over Route 128 that produced um, flash flooding. And and those storms um, are called power storms because they, they form and then they just pretty much rain itself out over the area. Uh, a very localized area, and there was not there's not much wind to move it. So, um, like for us, like today, you know, the, the storms dropped a lot of rain, like two to three inches per hour rainfall rate, but they were moving because of the, there was a lot of wind aloft to move it along. So, um, so power storm to answer the question, the power storms um, they do rain themselves out, and they um, they indicate that there's not a lot of wind available in the environment. Okay, um, and let's see, um, Rodney, I might need, if Hayden is still there, I might need, need his help on this one. Um, Katie wants to know, when was the last tornado reported in Essex County, Mass? I don't know if you can yell that one. Hayden's in the office, I believe, with you, so maybe he always knows the dates. Um, one second. Okay, I'll go on to the next question while you're checking that one out, so stand by, Katie. Uh, question from Anthony. You mentioned a couple of occasions where a water spout hits land and becomes a tornado. Can the reverse happen where a tornado reaches the coast and continues as a water spout? Absolutely. Um, and I'm, I don't recall anything recently where that's happened, but um, yes, that can happen. Um, so if it does, um, you know, the tornado warning is issued over land, we would issue a special marine warning over the water um, for a water spout. So yes, the opposite can happen too. Question from MJ, what is a derecho? A derecho is a long-lived, um, essentially, cluster of storms producing wind damage. So um, there's actually a definition to it, and I would have to uh, do a search online to get the exact numbers, but it's long-lived. Say 
you know, a, a weather system going from Chicago to Washington, D.C. Lasts for hours, produces widespread wind damage along its path. Um, it's been a while since we've had one in New England. Um, I can remember, I believe, one back in July of 95. There was another one in 1998. Uh, so they're rare, but those are very long-lived complexes of thunderstorms that produce essentially widespread and, and really what we call high-end wind damage, winds in excess of 70, 80 miles per hour. Question from Ronald, can we make a connection to the sea surface temperature peak off southern New England in early fall to those tornado reports in October? Uh, yeah, in that case, uh, you know, I think we could. Um, you know, in September, October, the water is obviously still warm. Um, it was a situation where actually temperatures were in the 50s those days. They weren't hot and humid days by any means. Um, but there was enough instability uh, that came in. Actually, it was southerly flow. And normally, you know, we think that that tends to kill off the thunderstorms. It actually helped to enhance them in that case. Um, there was a, you know, big temperature difference between the land and the water. A lot of energy for the storms to develop. And we had severe weather. Um, and in fact, I remember before that, uh, the October event, I was talking to the Storm Prediction Center about our severe weather threat that day. And they were kind of, you know, saying, well, it's only gonna be in the 50s, we're not gonna have anything. And, you know, then we said, well, that's true, but, you know, we have these sea surface temperatures that are warmer. We think there'll be this enough instability. We ended up, um, I believe they did end up putting an outlook for our area based upon that. So yeah, definitely later in the season, the sea surface temperature um, can certainly help. Uh, question from Karen, the Windsor Locks tornado. Oh, I'm gonna have to look this one up. <laughs> um, how long did it last? I believe it was, how, they want to know, how long did it last? How wide was it path length? Um, tornado passed less than a mile from my parents' house. Yeah, I, Karen, I don't have the specifics. I would have to look it up. Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head, but that was definitely an F4 and one of the, the strongest uh, in Southern New England. I believe still the strongest, uh, as I mentioned, in Connecticut. Uh, definitely a, a big, big storm. Let's see, John, question, why does the sky turn a yellow-green color when a severe thunderstorm is taking place? Um, sometimes that's from hail, believe it or not. Um, the hail and the thunderstorm can give kind of a greenish tinge to the storm. Uh, so usually that's why. Uh, so in that, if you see, should see those that coloring in the, in the storm, uh, you can pretty much expect hail in that case. So Rodney, do we have an answer on that for Essex County? Yeah, Joe, yeah, we do. Um, so. The last tornado in Essex County was on August 15, 1991. Oh, so it goes back to 1991. Wow. Yeah, the, the Revere tornado was close, but it technically was in Suffolk County. Correct. Yeah, that didn't cross into Essex. It was very close, but yeah. All right, so Katie, there's your answer, 1991. It's been a while. And speaking of been a while, that was the last landfalling hurricane, which was Bob, so... That's why we tell people, pay attention to the tropics. All right, thanks Rodney, and thank Hayden for me. Um, from Michael, uh, talking about Harwich last year, does there, observe the damage track, um, which appears to have jumped around. There'd be a damaged area, no damage, then a random tree felling. Am I correct in thinking the storm bounced up and down? Um, yeah, sometimes the path can be discontinuous. So it's not a straight damage path from a tornado. It can be kind of what we call discontinuous, where it's, uh, you know, you'll see some damage, then none, then a little further down, you'll see damage again. Um, and that's not unusual with, with tornadoes um, to see kind of a discontinuous path with the track. So good, good observation, Michael. Question from Fred. Are the warm ocean temps a concern for tropical storms this season? Fred, you're getting into tropical. That's okay. Um, yes, actually they are. Um, because, it, again, if you go back to our Tropical Weather 101 webinar, one of the ingredients is, sea surface temperatures above 80 degrees are favorable for hurricanes. Um, right now, the sea surface temperatures down in the, in the Bahamas and the Caribbean are, are fairly warm. Um, they're up there in the 80s. Um, and even off the East Coast right now, uh, you know, off the Carolinas, it's well into the upper 70s. Um, I believe we're in like low to mid 70s in parts of our area. So, um, you know, that's, that's enough to allow these storms to kind of make it all the way up the coast. We'll see what happens, um, but yes, that's when we have warm ocean temps, they're above average this year. Um, that is a concern for tropical activity because that helps, that's part of the fuel to help them uh, keep going. So good question. But Joe, I, yep. actually, the, I just looked it up. The, uh, the sea surface temperature south of Block Island is almost at 78 degrees. Oh, okay. So, yep, we are in the upper 70s warming up. Yeah, the hot, you know, these days of 90s, 
um, you know, even though it's not 90s over the water, it can still help really to raise the uh, the sea surface temperatures quite a bit. So, you know, the, the month of July has been pretty hot, um, as was June. So um, that's going to give us above average temperatures and more fuel for these storms. Good question. Uh, question from Joshua. Can smaller thunderstorms like a single cell produce a tornado? Um, usually not. Um, typically with a single cell pulse storm, you'll just have wind damage as the core collapses. Um, but, you know, sometimes on the, the leading edge of the gust front, you can have a gust NATO, which is a quick spin up. Um, not a true tornado in the sense, but um, can produce kind of a, a swirling damage pattern in itself. It's usually weaker. Um, so, I, you know, maybe a gust NATO would, would appear on that. Um, also, oh, from Philip, here's a suggestion. Good radar site. Um, to look at is, is the uh, College of DuPage. That's right, thanks, Philip. So it's weather.cod.edu and then slash forecast. So weather.cod.edu, that's actually a good site for model data, radar, and satellite uh, data. Pretty much everything they have there, College of DuPage. From Ronald, reports of green skies during tornado outbreaks, fact or fiction? Thank you. Um, again, this I, this goes back to the hail. So I would say, Rodney, I would say fact. How about you with that green skies during tornado outbreaks? What's your vote? Yeah, that's hail. Yeah, sure. so it would be. And again, typically when you have tornadoes, you're talking, for the most part, it's a supercell with large hail, and that's where you get that green tinge. So yes, we will say fact on that one, Ronald. Let's see, uh, from Philip, do TV Mets and academic partners share their live Doppler radar, especially in Western Mass where the radar is not well sampled? Yes, we do. Um, in fact, um, a lot of the TV stations have these mobile Doppler radars, so um, they provide us access when those are being, um, when they're activated. Um, we've had them uh, placed on the Cape, we've had them placed in Worcester recently, um, so those are useful. We also have um, UMass Dartmouth has a radar, it's called a CASA radar, which is a, um, a high powered but smaller radar system out in Amherst. And that's also on the web. You can actually do a search on that and find it just to UMass Amherst radar. Um, and so that's another source of radar data that we have in our office in addition to um, the Doppler radar network. And we also have the FAA radars um, that are at some of the airports. For us, we have one in South Weymouth, uh, Mass. It's a terminal Doppler weather radar run by the FAA. So we have that as well. Good question. Let's see, from Michael as a postscript, I checked a lot of the damaged trees and many were healthy twisted alongside the diseased trees. Yes, so Michael, that was from the tornado path um, being uh, just kind of skipping along. So that definitely was tornado damage. Oh, Rodney, follow up from Katie. Where in Essex County was it? <laughs> so I'll, let, I'll put you to work on that. Uh, from yeah, we believe it. Uh, it's near Georgetown. Okay, Georgetown, uh, yep. Okay, there you go, Katie. Georgetown, 1991. Uh, from Catherine, are the Mamatis clouds most always seen with tornadoes here? Rodney, you want to take a stab at that one? Sure. Uh, so Mamatis clouds are basically um, the, the the sinking of the, of the air at the base of an anvil. So you don't necessarily have to see um, a tornado to see a Mama, to see Mamatis clouds. Uh, in fact, I, I can tell you from my my limited storm chasing experience. Um, sometimes when I'm disappointed with not seeing a tornado, I often see, you know, a very nice display of my mother's clouds at sunset, and that kind of makes, you know, the disappointment less, uh, a little bit less. <laughs> but, but yeah, to, um, you know, to answer your question, you can see my mother's clouds for sure with tornadoes because it, you know, it's, they form at the base of an anvil or an overshooting top, but you don't have to, um, they're not necessarily associated with tornadoes. Okay, good question. And we just have a few more, we're almost done. Uh, from Jack, can terrain have an effect on tornado strength? I've heard rumors that Connecticut River Valley's dip in elevation contribute to the unusual strength of the Windsor Locks tornado. Um, yes, actually it can. And in fact, the Connecticut River Valley is, is actually a kind of a natural source of what we call with that wind shear. Um, a lot of times if we have winds ahead of a cold front out of the southwest, for example, um, winds will actually back along the Connecticut River Valley, meaning they'll be more of the southeast. And that gives us more turning. So instead of a southwest wind at the ground, 
to maybe a westerly wind aloft, you would have a southeast wind, which is turning its way to south, southwest, and then west. That's a lot more spin for the atmosphere. Um, so yes, the terrain, certainly the river valleys um, have an effect, not just the Connecticut River Valley. Um, we've seen this with the Mohawk River Valley, the Hudson River Valley in, in New York uh, in particular. So it's the larger river valleys um, are really able to channel that wind um, up and down the valley. So again, the Connecticut River Valley, Hartford, uh, Windsor Locks, <clears throat> you'll see more of a, a south or southeast wind a lot of times um, as a result of, of air kind of channeling up that valley. So yes, good question. And let's see. From Andrew, is it true the first ever tornado recorded was in Massachusetts? Uh, yeah, actually, Andrew, that's, you know, going back through the, the books, um, I believe it was in Cambridge. Um, and it's one actually one of our weather history posts. I think it might have been a July post. Um, but, you know, certainly tornadoes have occurred, you know, before, uh, you know, the, the colonial times. But um, as far as being recorded, I, that's, you know, there is some debate, but I believe, yes, that is true, that the first ever tornado was recorded in Cambridge. And I don't remember the year offhand. That might have been the, the 1600s. A good question. Uh, from Joshua, and I'm going to hand this one to Rodney. Why do more tornadoes occur in Western Mass than Eastern Mass? Yeah, hi, Joshua. Um, good question. So, um, you know, I would boil it down to two reasons. Um, the first reason is um, because of the terrain. Um, you have, you know, in western Massachusetts and Connecticut, you have the, the Connecticut River Valley. And like Joe has alluded to, um, the river valley, you know, serves as a channel for the winds. And, and, you know, usually they come from the south or southeast. and you know, they pushed north into the northern Connecticut River Valley. And remember, a key ingredient for tornadoes is um, you need to have the change in wind direction or wind speed with height. And, you know, a lot of our storms, we have uh, winds out from the west and northwest um, at higher altitudes. So the, the river valley allows for the lower altitude winds to be coming in from the south, and which is totally different from winds at higher altitude so that provides an environment for uh, for for more spin uh the other reason is towards eastern massachusetts and rhode island especially earlier on in the spring the ocean temperatures are so cold that they they just inhibit uh updraft and storm formation you know in in places like boston um but later on in the summer um as the ocean temperatures warm up they can actually serve as a as a catalyst for um, for severe storms development, so um, so the, um, overall there are two reasons: first, the terrain in Western Massachusetts and Connecticut, and the second reason is the, just because of the proximity to the ocean. Um, all right, thanks, Rodney, and that will do it for our questions. So I'm glad we got through all of them. Very good, and thanks for everybody for sticking around. I know. We're over an hour, but appreciate it. Um, again, I want to thank you for attending tonight. And Rodney, thank you for helping us out. Um, as always, we really like hearing your feedback. So you can email me. Uh, my email address has been on the screen, or you can use your webinar confirmation. Um, I'll get back to you. It may take, you know, with our upcoming tropical activity here, it might take a few days. But um, certainly, I'll get back to you. Tell, you know, tell us what you like, what you don't like. If you think of a question afterwards, send it on to me. Um, any suggestions for future webinars? We'd love, you know, to hear it. We, we love doing these for you and being able to interact with everybody. Um, so again, uh, thanks for joining us and please uh, stay weather aware the next few days. Um, you know, this, this tropical system will be somewhere off the East Coast. Um, we can't say exactly, you know, is it going to hit New England for sure? Um, if you've seen the cone, we are in the, in the cone area. Um, but just remember, you know, no matter where the storm goes, we may end up having some impacts, whether it's rain or wind or, or whatever. So just pay attention the next few days. And, um, you know, you may need to, if you live on the coast, have a plan, you know what you need to do. Um, and obviously stay tuned to the latest forecast information. So we will be working with the National Hurricane Center closely, I'm sure, over the next few days. So thanks again, everybody, for joining. I hope you have a good evening and take care. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone.